So uh, this is a fairly decent sized buff room, but I'm excited that you, you were all able to squeeze in. So it seems that the unofficial theme of this DrupalCon is confess your sins, as uh, demonstrated by Dries. So I would like to tell you in that spirit uh, about uh, a self-reflection I had about six or seven months ago. And I was thinking about what I was doing, and I'd like to share with you that I've realized that I'm not so good at what I do. And if I want to you know, level up the honesty level one more notch, I would even say that I suck at what I do. And obviously, it, it makes me feel a little uncomfortable sharing with you. It, with you. I, f I feel that I uh, alienate myself from everybody. So again, in the spirit of Drupal, of being all-inclusive, I would say that we suck at what we do. There. That's perfect. And I say so because I think that our definition of what we're doing is missing one, one key element. If I ask any random person over here, what are, we, what are you doing? You'll probably say, I'm a web developer. What are you doing? Web developer. What are you doing? I'm a web developer. Nobody says, I'm a web maintainer. I maintain my websites. Because we're constantly thinking about developing new stuff and new stuff and new stuff. We hardly think about what we currently have. And to demonstrate what I'm saying, I will give a very basic example, the fact that we are breaking our design once every 10 days. So maybe you do it once every 14 days, or maybe once every seven days. But the fact is that it happens quite often. And again, I'm not blaming anyone. We know how it is. A junior developer is coming. We ask him, please move the logo 10 pixels to the right on the home page. We deploy it to the live site. And two days later, we realize in some unknown page, the footer is completely broken. And when, when we're coming to a DrupalCon, when we are reading Twitter, when we are reading blog posts, we keep hearing about BigPipe and GraphQL, GraphQL and headless Drupal and advanced Git and whatnot. But we hardly hear about how people are actually working on maintaining their sites. And I have another harsh statement is that we don't care about our live site. So indeed, it's, an, it's a harsh accusation. So I'd like to be a bit more accurate about it is our developers don't care about it. And it's not that they don't really care. They care about it. But they're actually afraid of the live site. Here, I will t dictate the tweet for you. Developers are afraid of the live site. Why is that? You have a team of five people. There is the senior developer. He or she are doing all the deployments. They have the credentials. None of the developers want even to get the credentials because they simply don't want to break the site. They are afraid of it. How do we see it? Well. Developers care about their local computer, they care about the dev site, and we can see it through the different amount of work that they go in you know, uh, improving their tools. So for example, this is a snippet of a Travis configuration. You don't need to read whatever is inside. You just need to look at all at what you have over here. This is some developer probably sat down for a good few days and worked and make sure that they are able to mock everything, the code, the database, Apache Solar, whatnot. We're seeing crazy stuff. I mean, I've even seen that there was so much testing going in Travis that developers had to split the amount of tests because it reached the 50 minutes uh, maximum. So this is really excessive testing. And I'm not saying this is a bad thing. This is like best practices at its best. It's a good thing. How good it is? It's an Obama holding a beer with a thumbs up, with a thumbs up doing an impressed face good. It's that good. But what happens after the client has paid us a million dollars to make their site and we really... We've done everything, all the best practices, all the tests. Travis is working for hours and hours and hours. And then we launch the site. And what do we do? Usually what we do, we connect it to Pingdom at best. Now, Pingdom is a terrific service, right? It's basically sending an HTTP request once a minute asking, are you up? Are you up? Are you up? It's OK. How OK? Adjusting Bieber, doing adjusting Bieber face OK. It's that OK. But the problem with Pingdom, it has no insight. It knows just if your site, it knows only about the, really, the, the catastrophe, if the site is up or down, if something really wrong with the application or something really wrong with the server. 
but it doesn't know anything about the key functionality. It doesn't know if you can user log, if you can do a user login, if you can add to cart, if you can see the recent news item. In fact, about a year or two ago, the Hezbollah hacked Drupal or Gael, and according to Pingdom, everything was fine. But no, it was not fine. It was completely hacked. So, how do you know your site is working? You have to monitor it. But before we dive into the technical stuff and all the different tools that we're using, here's the really quick two-liner value proposition, the one that I can always tell people and see if they care about it or don't care about it. I'm assuming you have a site and the site is crucial for you or for your client. And you would like to know that things are working in it. Key functionality is working. Like I said, the user login and to add to cart and whatnot. And if something, if that key functionality won't be working, you'll be losing some money and you'll be losing that prestige. That's the value proposition. And now from that point onwards, we can see different tools that we are using in order to try and give an answer to that problem. So today I'd like to go over different uh, tools that we're using. One of them is uh, something that we've developing in Gizra for the past six or seven years. It's called Shuv, Shuv.io. Shuv means, again, in Hebrew, it's an open source project. Uh, it's, we call it for developers. By developer, we started it as an internal tool to try and tackle the problems that we identified in Gizra. And like 24 hours later, we said an internal tool equals a public tool, so it's just out there. What we are trying to do with this tool is basically try to solve the big problem using simple solutions. So let's understand the problems. Basically, we're talking about two main subjects. One is visual regression, the second is live monitoring. So what is visual regression? So at its most basic thing, uh, visual regression testing is talking about having some tool that I will be able to give it the URL, and then that tool will go mimicking a human going through the browser, take a screenshot of a site at a certain uh, known time that we know that this is working fine. And from that point onwards, we are getting, sorry, and then it is getting a baseline image. This image is now our baseline. And from that point onwards, we can rerun the script over and over again. It will go to the site again, take another screenshot, and compare it with the baseline image. If everything is fine, everything is fine. If something is wrong, meaning we have a regression, it will create a regression image. It will also create a diff image, so we as humans can easily see the problem. Over here, you can see a quick video that I took of Platform SH. All the errors that you see are deliberate. I've created them. They didn't really have a bug. This is only for demonstration reasons. You can see that there is a baseline image. There is some regression. We are able to identify it. And if it's hard to see, we can click on the Show Diff button and see the differences. So there are many, many different tools, open source tools that allow you, uh, uh, open source or closed source, closed source tools that allow you to create those baseline images and do this diff. Basically, there are two categories. One category is uh, uh, sites, different services, sites that allow you through their user interface to add the URL, and it will take the screenshot for you and will and will do all the job. The second category is uh, using code, different, different libraries. What you're seeing over here, I'm using WebDriver CSS. It's an open source, uh, it's an open source solution. It's uh, maintained by people from Sauce Labs, and since one month ago, I'm also one of the maintainers of it. And what you can see over here, the code, again, you don't need to understand uh, too much of it. Basically, we're declaring it should show the home page, and then I pass the URL and the dot web driver CSS, that's the command that does the screenshot. And the reason that I've decided I want to use something that is code is because I'm a developer and my team are developers. And we want all our tests, all our code to be version controlled. I want it to be part of my Git workflow. I want to be able to do a pull request. I want to be able to do a code review on it. And another very important factor, and it might sound weird because we created it, there is no vendor lock-in, meaning all our data is sitting part of Git. There's no, absolutely no data that is sitting somewhere else. A very important factor of WebDriver CSS, and again, WebDriver CSS is a completely uh, uh, independent tool. It has nothing to do with Shuv. We just created some nice integration between WebDriver CSS and Shuv. 
one of, one of uh, the good things about WebDriver CSS is it, it's that it can run all the tests, again, not just PhantomJS, meaning not only against a headless browser, but against real browsers. And that's pretty important because in the end we are designer, we are designing and implementing the design for real browsers to be consumed by real people. So you can use it against your real, um, your real browsers in the office or have your own Selenium cloud that nobody has because it's super complicated to set up. Or you can, uh, or you can pay 100 bucks a month or so to browser stack or source lab. These are third party services which basically allow you to provision lots of different, lots of different um, uh, browsers on different platforms. What you can see over here, the gizra.com site is actually built on Jekyll, a static site generator. So whenever we're doing a git commit, we are running tests on the design of the site, meaning we're asking browser stack, hey, please provision an Internet Explorer 11 on a Windows 7 and check our design just before it's being pushed. And having that uh, predictable, repeatable, and locked environment that we're getting through browser stack or source lab mean we can constantly check the baseline and know that there are not differences due to suddenly something in the browser has changed. We're always checking against the same environments. And what's fun about writing those tests in WebDriver CSS is you can actually write it once but target different platforms and different uh, browsers. So again, not really important the, the code that's going on here, but basically I've written the test one. It just knows it knows, needs to go to a certain URL and take a screenshot of either the whole page or certain section on it. And I can run it for the first time using uh, a Chrome browser. It's completely arbitrary. I decided that Chrome signifies Chrome 43, and later on I can run it using IE 11. Now one of the problem, and our problem as web developers, is it is so hard to really target all those different platforms, all those different uh, browsers, and all those different viewports. So again, a nifty uh, feature in WebDriver CSS, I've written all my tests it's completely agnostic to which size of, of, of the viewport. I can s set the screen width and tell it, listen, go into that URL now four times, one for a desktop size, one for a tablet, and one for mobile. And we can actually take it even one step further and use the fact that Chrome can emulate different devices, iPhone and Android and so on, and actually emulate not just, not just check the, the mobile viewport, but really, but really emulate a real device, because maybe the tablet is working fine, maybe the mobile is working fine, but when you really emulate it as an iPhone, you might see regression. But there is a very important aspect. I think it's even more important than just saying, I have features, viewports, and, and browsers, and that's the morale of the developers. I mean, we all love to assign the junior developer that just came in and tell him, listen, in the end of the office, really far, far away, no, where nobody wants to go, there is a computer. It runs Windows, and it has IE 11 on it. Please test it. So, I mean, even you, if you're like a heartless, per heartless person like me, <laughs> it's like headless Drupal, but, her <laughs> but less cool. <laughs> Even if you're a heartless person and you say, okay, I don't care about their feelings. I mean, just sit all day, you know, 9 to 5, and check it constantly. Check I-11 and I-10 and whatnot. I mean, in the end, they are just humans. They, they cannot do the job of a machine, and this is something that a machine can definitely, can, definitely can do. So obviously visual regression, it sounds nice if we, we would have a static page, but our sites, um, unfortunately for visual regression, are not static. How do we deal with dynamic content? I mean, over here you can see this video, which I keep refreshing, and I have this uh, flip card widget, and I have the carousel that the caption is changing, and every time the text is uh, completely changing, the length, of the, cha the, the length of the text and the text itself. So how do we deal with that? Exclude, remove, hide. 
This is not just the slogan of some racist group on the run, but this is a really command of WebDriver CSS, which allow us to deal with the dynamic content. <laughs> I had to take it out. So basically, when we're approaching such a dynamic page, we need to decide what are the different strategies of how to deal with different elements. So when I say exclude, I actually mean I want to have a black rectangle over the element. When I say that was exclude. When I say hide, I actually want to hide the element but still keep the, the space that it is taking. When I say remove, I want to completely remove it. So again, you shouldn't care too much about the code, but I'm able to tackle it through code, through CSS or XPath Select, or I'm able to say, this part I want you to exclude, this part I want you to remove, and so on. And then we are reaching this part, and if I would do a baseline image, it will look something like that. That's the, the, the output that would, I would have because all the dynamic content, I don't want it there because I don't want to have every time the test to fail. And then every time I show this image, I have this annoying dev come to me and say, but hey, Amitai, then you don't have 100% test coverage. To which I reply, hey, fuck you. Up until now, you had 0% test coverage. <laughs> so it will be fine if you just have 40%. <laughs> It's actually the first time I show this image. <laughs> but I would answer that exact same answer. It's OK if you have 10%, if you have 40%, if you have 60% test coverage, it's much better than having a 0% test coverage. And actually, that annoying dev that was asking that annoying question kind of lives inside of me, because I was telling it myself as well. I mean, it's OK if my visual regression isn't doing 100% test coverage. It, it cannot. But there's still some functionality that I want to check, right? I have the text over here. I want to check that some text is, uh, is there on the page. I would love to check if there's at least one paragraph or there's no more than four paragraphs over there. And then we move into what we call the live monitor. So before we dive into the live monitor, the visual regression part that I've shown you, it can run a, it can run against multiple environments. You can run it against the live site. It has its merits. Or you can uh, run it against the dev site, you know, finding the design issues just, because, just before they are being put onto the live site. Or you can even configure your Travis, like we've seen earlier, on every uh, git commit, every git push, to check, to check the design. So the idea of the live monitor is actually to complement the, the, the the visual regression testing with functional tests and to test key functionality. So it's not just the user login. It's not just to add to cart. These are things that we control. So maybe we have tons of tests for that. But we know that, you know, in the end, all the tests that we do on the dev sites, they are, we're just trying to mock the live site. But it's not really the live site. Because the live site might be using third party services, right? I might be using Facebook comment. I might be using Stripe JS for the cart. I have no control over the code. But I want to know when something goes wrong, right? I want to know that if I have a uh, Stripe JS card and suddenly it's not working, I want to do something about it. I want to be proactive about it. So maybe I can send it to my developers and they can fix something and they realize it's some configuration that got broken. But maybe I don't have control about it, but I can do something very really important. I can put even a message saying, you know, we have a service, a service interruption we are aware of that. And the value of it is if you have an e-commerce site and some person is coming to buy your watch for $20 and they see that something is not working there, you just lost probably more than $20. Because if you don't have any message and the, the site suddenly looks broken, and well, they, they won't have no trust in your site. So you probably mo lost a client and you lost your, some of your prestige uh, for in the community, and it's really hard to put a label, a price, la a price tag, sorry, on the prestige. So here's an example of a site we monitor. We do not maintain it. We just um, monitor it for a third-party service. And they had a problem. This is a site that has uh, private content and public content. And one hap what happens when we have private content in sites? Sometimes they become public. Why? Just because that's reality. And who finds it? Usually the client. <laughs> but not the client client, not the client that pays us. The end user, the one that actually got into the site as anonymous user by habit, went into the URL expecting to see uh, an access denied, and realized 
all the content is open for everybody. So they send a, a, a kind by, but firm email, hey, something is really wrong and the developers are rushing and fixing everything. And what happens next? We push, you know, we push uh, a fix to do the live site and what usually happens is that the developer will check it when he goes before, just before he goes to sleep, and then the day after, and then after two days, he will start to lose interest because they have other things to do. So that bug was fixed, but what, may, what assures us that it will not repeat? Nothing. <laughs> Maybe, you know, each one with their own God, so they're praying a lot, but nothing. That, that's how it is. And I mean, if you feel that oh my God, I know, I, I know it. it, it happens to me, probably everybody else are doing it differently. No, everybody are doing it like that. I mean, all the, 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 all the big companies and all the small companies are doing that. So over here, what you can see, this is a BHAT test. Again, if you don't know BHAT, it's not very important. We have some tests saying, given I'm an anonymous user, when I try to visit a certain URL, then I should not have access to that page. Not that complicated, right? Pretty simple even but very valuable. So the idea of Shuv is, Shuv doesn't care, it's agnostic to which framework you will use to write your test, your live monitor test. It could be Behat or Casper JS or Cucumber, whatever. Basically, it's, we're taking a very similar approach like Travis. When you log in into Shuv, you log in or you register and log in through your GitHub. So we have your GitHub credential for your public repository or if, or if you allow us also for your private repositories. And we show you a list of all your different repositories. And just like Travis, when you click a repository from that point onwards, Shuv will start listening to the repository and every, uh, every few minutes, every hour, you set the interval. It will git clone your repository into an isolated Docker container and run your test for you. In a way, it's a glorified Jenkins, right? It's doing this task for you over and over again. You could probably set up some, uh, uh, some Gen Jenkins instance, but what we are trying to do is make it easier for everybody. And in a way, it's not just Jenkins, because when we are running, when we are running the test periodically, if we are hitting an error, we're not immediately sending an incident. We're not immediately sending an email because, you know, there could be network issues or whatever. Something could go wrong. So we're running the test. If it failed, we're immediately running it again on a different server, on a different IP, just to mitigate any, uh, any risk that something in our server is not working. Even if it failed for the second time, we immediately run a third, and only when it's only when it failed for the third time, we are sending an email. And the idea of the test that we are doing on the live site is almost the complete opposite of how we are running tests on development, on Travis, meaning we're not running now a test suite of 50 minutes, not at all. The idea is to check really quickly the key functionality. So your tests are running and you know, running about one minute or so. Can I log in? Can I add to cart? Can I see the recent can I see the recent news item? And when I say the add to cart, I don't mean that you really need to, uh, to follow the entire flow, including uh, going to PayPal and somehow paying and somehow getting a refund. Again, watch out from that purist sound in your head that tells you, well, hmm, I, I didn't do nothing up until now, but let's try to jump to, to do everything. It would be probably enough to click on the add to cart and to see that the product was added to the, to the cart. We've already caught a bunch of errors that, you know, we didn't know about it before we did some live monitoring. So just like Travis, we have this .shuv YML file and we're trying to facilitate and make it as easy as possible to write the test so you can add a Selenium add-on so you could basically uh, test using real JavaScript. You could actually see what's going on here. We have encrypted, encrypted keys, so even if it's a public repository, you could add, uh, you could add secret credential. But this is the really nitty-gritty. But let's talk about what's really the value of what, or not the value, what my, my, what my goal is with doing Shuv. So a part of a being a millionaire somehow, <laughs> it's a nice goal, but I don't believe it will, it, it will uh, reach, or not, not, I won't reach it immediately. But my passion right now is try to make it not just a best practice, because I yet to show any person 
told them about visual regression and live monitor, and they were like, it, it's not important. Everybody's saying, yeah, it sounds right, right? I, I see a lot of head nodding over here, but if I would stop my presentation over here, it would have stopped in the, in, in the head nodding, I feel. So that's why I want to dedicate the next few sentences to what my goal is. My goal is not just to declare it, this is a best practice. There are so many different best practices, and you know, in the end, of, in the end we have a project, we, have, uh, we are rushing to do it as, as quickly of, as possible. We need to choose our different, uh, our different best practices. So my goal over here is to make it a community-approved uh, best practice. Something just the same way that BHAT was three years ago when people hardly use it and now it's the de facto the way of, uh, of, of writing your projects. So I'm writing blog posts. Oh, sorry. This one. So a part of the blog post, a part of the tweets, the next thing that uh, the next thing that we've, we've done in Gizra was create a Yeoman generator. So basically you can write Yo Shuv, it will ask you for your URL, and then it will scaffold all the files that you need to run your first visual regression testing, to run your first live monitor testing, and a dot .shuv YML. In, in shuv.io, there is a bunch of different tutorials that can guide you through the visual regression testing because I know it can sound overwhelming. This is, uh, for most people, probably completely new and also the concept of doing the live monitoring. But for the last slide, or I'll say that the takeaway of this, of this presentation, beyond that we say that there is a visual regression testing and beyond what we're saying, the live monitor, and beyond the fact that we should address the fact that there are trivial things that we are all doing really, really bad and they can somehow be solved is if you decide to go to take that path, don't try to jump from 0% to 100%, okay? Take a balanced approach. I mean, if, if you heard my the Gizra Way presentation, I was, I, was, uh, I was saying the center that best practices need to be practiced. Even in Gizra, we haven't jumped and immediately started doing all our projects, uh, adding visual regression testing to all our projects, but six or seven months later, now 100% of our projects are with visual regression. And it's enough to have one single, one single baseline of your him for over your homepage. It's enough to have one single silly test that will just go to your live site and check that the user can click on uh, user login and a form is presented. And that's kind of uh, all of it. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? You already know that I don't care about that awkward silence, right? I can, I can do a 15 minutes like that. <laughs> yeah. I guess I could. Oh my God, actually doing contribution for Drupal 8. I don't know how to deal with that. I, I should take a balanced approach. But yeah, you, you could do it. I think there, there is an issue, there is an issue, queue, uh, an issue on Drupal.org talking about different ways of, uh, of, of running the test. And this is, I mean, it's possible. And again, I think that part uh, where I say there is no vendor lock-in is super important. I mean, Drupal doesn't want any vendor locking with me or anybody, right? So the code, the code is, will belong to Drupal. Now the only question is, if there is a regression, for example, where is the regression being pushed, which is just to make our life as humans easier to, to identify where the problem is. So yeah, it can definitely use Shuv. Any more questions? All right, thank you everybody. <laughs>